again, for privacy, uh, be aware that this uh, meeting is being recorded. And um, so, and it's, I record, I'm recording it in the cloud. And if anybody's interested in the um, recording, I will make it available or we will make it available. And uh, so anyway, a reminder that, you know, we should, we should have a, a warm and fuzzy feeling about participating in this, you know, we're an open community and we want everybody to feel uh, that they have a voice and that their voices are going to be heard as much as anybody else. Um, next page. Okay. Uh, again, this has been, this has been a little bit of confusion, at least in my other research group, uh, about the goals of the IRTF that we're here for research. We're not doing standards. And while you know, some of the work that we do here uh, may be uh, you know, transited into the IETF at one point, uh, we're currently doing research and it's completely wonderful. Uh, so this is for today. This is all the connectivity. Uh, we have obviously all the meeting materials. I think we have most of the, uh, I think, only missing one presentation, so everything's there. Uh, there's an etherpad for people who are on the on the call right now. Uh, maybe uh, any of you want to send a message on the chat saying record your name in the etherpad because we're going to um, set up the blue sheets. Uh, for the moment, my XMPP client doesn't work, but uh, if people want a jab, that's fine. Uh, again, all sessions are recorded. Uh, take your video off because it's very, first it's used a ton of bandwidth. And second, it's a bit disturbing. Uh, keep yourself muted. Okay, uh, for the mic, the mic Q, the plus Q adds you to the, the Q, the minus, the Q minus removes you. Um, I, I will tell you that I've been in two or three meetings where we had, we had this. It works okay, but I, I think it's, it needed, it would need a better thing to get full cues, but that's fine. I was thinking of using Twitter, but um, we do that in conferences, but that's fine. That, that is fine. And uh, so again, uh, please use the, the etherpad to, to record your name. Um, so I, I love the, the comment of Eve actually added the red thing here. Um, Yes, we, we should make this more exciting. Uh, maybe it's a goal for uh, the next IETF um, to, or to the next interim to find something that's more exciting than just say we foster research and computing and the network. Maybe we want to do something better, but for the moment that's what we do. Uh, so um, I think with all the development that's happening in this, in this field though, I agree with Eve that we could make them that a little bit more uh, exciting. Uh, I don't know. I'm not very good at that. What I meant by that was pointed. Make it more pointed. But maybe the simplicity of it is just fine. Well, I now. think exciting. I think exciting is is a good thing. But yeah, I think it's maybe it's a bit too vanilla. You know, we have to remember that we wrote this when we were just a proposed research group, and now that there's more buy-in but anyway so our goal right now is fostering research and computing in a network and our focus is pretty wide so we look at architectures and protocols and real world use case applications work in progress and i would say i could add something really there right now which is impact of computing in the network on the current internet and, and i think if we look at what is going to come as presentation in this um, um, the, yeah, if we look at what's the, the presentations of today and a lot of the, the stuff that's happening uh, in the world of computing and the network right now, there is a lot of research on the impact of that on the current and the future internet. So maybe this is something um, that I will um, um, add to this. Um, obviously, after this meeting. So, uh, oh, by the way, uh, Jeffrey is taking notes. So maybe Jeffrey, you want to take that as a note. And thank you very much for taking notes. 
Okay, so um, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, obviously uh, we're almost, you know, we're halfway through this zero um, item. Then we have a number of research presentations. Uh, two actually come from uh, a conference I attended uh, at the end of February, which is in, right now seems a long time ago. Um, one is about some recent work that uh, I've been doing with um, Ericsson and um, Princeton with the help of Eve. And a lot of things related to the one data model because uh, a lot of things related to uh, having a computing network works, it deals a lot with uh, how the data is represented so it can be actioned on uh, in the network. So we have that and thank you for all the presenters. And then we have our, our draft updates, which are the drafts that are um, active right now. So we have um, the, the microservices, the security support, some requirements from China Mobile and uh, an update again on discovery, again, related to this idea of putting computing and network and finding where the data or eventually where all the resources are. Um, we want to have, uh, so again, and we're going to conclude with, with some ideas. Do we want to have some research group items? Um, do we want to prep from Madrid? I guess you guys saw, I don't know if you saw, but there is a message going around that uh, with what's happening, there is a um, contingency plan if we do not go to um, Spain in the summer. So we can actually prepare for having something maybe virtually uh, in June. A and then open discussion if, if anybody else has um, um, anything to say, it's fine. Okay, um, I'm almost done and I'll let, I'll let, I'll let the, the, the um, chair to, to the coach. Um, I just wanted to do a, a small update because it was very related to this. Uh, there was a conference again, like I said, um, about five, six weeks ago in Paris. And part of it was a network workshop. Um, and it was basically about P4 applications and services and, and two papers uh, from that conference. I invited them to, or we invited them to this this meeting, uh, th there was a sideline discussions on sure, of P4 and uh, Tofino architecture because we had somebody from Intel Barefoot and uh, it started this discussion about how do we want to do maybe uh, filtering and processing of packets at the edge <clears throat> beyond just what is done in the header. Uh, which was, uh, and also, could we do multi stream and or like some kind of multi threading, which is something that Eve uh, had talked about. So there was that. And there was a tutorial. Um, there was a panel on computing and the network. And this was uh, basically uh, with a bunch of people who had been the keynotes and I was added. And so there was a um, a general agreement, I think, amongst all presenters about this cloud edge continuum evolution uh, towards uh, the network computing and how to, sh to share and discover and uh, execute functions uh, both at the edge and in the cloud. There was um, questions though, and because again, so when we're talking right now, a lot of times we're talking about IoT and a lot of edge networking, but I think we have to be careful to say that we are looking at the whole network. We're looking at both the location functions in the edge, in the cloud, and in between. There was some dissent and voice from a, um, I think he's a chief engineer somewhere in Germany, um, on locating the computing in the switch fabric. And that actually, and for him, the rest was, was not in the network. Uh, I think he was the only one, but he raised a good aspect. And the reason I put it there, um, is that um, erase the aspect of adding computing inside the actual code that is running switches. And that is interesting because it was not P4, it was not adding another switch, it was trying to do things 
in the current switch fabric and in the current switch code. And, you know, research, interesting. Uh, obviously, the whole thing was that, obviously, and that's what I said that maybe in our goals, we should look at the uh, the impacts because it was seen as a major emerging trend uh, in the network. And because of that, uh, the next year conference is going to be about this melding of networking and uh, and computing, the theme of the whole thing. And uh, so this should be very interesting. And I've started thinking, uh, I know that um, uh, Melinda uh, Shore, who is anywhere, has, has raised this idea of maybe, maybe co-locating interim meetings uh, with uh, conferences. And uh, because of the, of the timing of this one, we could actually think of maybe hosting a face-to-face -face once we can actually have face-to-face -face meetings again. Um, co-located with with ICIN next year, and but you know this is really far in the future, but that could be uh, one thing. And having a combination of face to face and virtual, like we've done uh, for network coding, for example, with meetings and and MIT and everywhere. So that's it. Um, next next slide, I think is is. Um, so I will let um, Jeffrey talk now. And I'm going on. Yeah, this is the list of uh, the active jobs current. Uh, <coughs> so uh, these these jobs cover the requirements, use case, and architecture. For uh, so so please previous slide please. And uh, one thing, yeah. So uh, so so we. With, so the last one, so the last one is the, the, the latest one. So this is a new after the Singapore meeting about security and privacy. I think this is uh, good at, to address the, uh, the, the question raised in the IAB review meeting. Right. So uh, maybe uh, five of these drafts will be introduced uh, today. Next, next page, please. Next slides. And these two are uh, in fact expired. So by uh, uh, and mine, addressing the use cases in external reality and uh, the uh, DCN. So this uh, this was these are the earliest ones. So we plan to uh, renew them after this meeting and the, taking the discussions in the whole in past years into account. Thank you. Okay. Um, being uh, cautious or at least observant of the time and that we're, we don't have that much of it, I will quickly say that um, we're pretty much right on our milestones that we created. Uh, when we were first launched or even before. Um, and uh, as you could see from the internet drafts, we've got a pretty healthy set of uh, topics that, um, that meet the milestones. If you go to our website, you can sort of see how we've clustered the internet drafts under the milestones. Um, but the point is that, you know, we focused on landscapes and challenges, uh, directions and requirements. Um, where many of these things have been addressed um, sort of indirectly. And so some of what we would like to accomplish in the next round is to really hone the milestones. And so I think that's what the, um, that's what the question marks relate to. Uh, so we're, we're definitely at a point um, where we are trying to get our legs under us in terms of sort of what does the broader ecosystem looks, look like and to actually ask the question um, uh, about, you know, how do we get all of these drafts um, sort of adopted as internet drafts associated with our working group? Because now they're, I think they're all, um, th there's no formality to the fact that they've all been written. Um, and so I think that's also a milestone that we'd, we'd like to meet um, pretty uh, urgently or at least immediately. So, um, the the big work ahead, as you can see from the question marks, is really how do we scope this now that we've been blessed as a as a research group is how do we really appropriately scope this and um, make some headway towards um, 
close that call. Um, we, I think we should launch into our, um, into our presentations at this point, because I think we're already off our schedule. <laughs> so why don't we do that without further ado? And uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I will stop sharing and I will ask all the presenters to start sharing their own screen. So I'm going to stop sharing. How do I stop sharing? This is stop sharing. Okay, and the first presentation is from um, Italy. And um, Marco, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Okay, hi. Good morning uh, or good afternoon for you. So please share and, uh, you know, you have 10, 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, can you actually see it now? Do. Okay. So, hi, Mario. Hi, everybody. Thank you for the, the invitation. I'm a PhD student from the University of Rome, Tor Vergala. And this work is um, content work with a colleague of the computer science department and the department. Uh, so, so the mic start. is a little faint. So, if you could be a little um, cautious about uh, being closer to your mic, that'd be great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, let's first take a look at the scenario we're dealing with. And um, in the last years, uh, like CPUs start, struggle to improve their performance because of the end of Moore's law and their scaling. But still, we need uh, acceleration for so many different tasks in, the, in, this, in this time. So uh, the new architect architectural approach we try to follow is the one of the so-called uh, domain-specific architectures, which are architectures that, uh, rather than general-purpose CPUs, are tailored to a specific domain of applications. Uh, they're programmable and they can be power efficient. As, at, just as a quick example, let's mention Google's TPUs for machine learning, GPUs for graphical processing or FPGAs. And from the networking perspective, as you know, we switched from the idea of the, the network being just plumbing and switches being just too um, slow or power consuming in order to make some computation to uh, new classes of switches, which can be very fast, programmable, and power efficient too. Um, so there is this whole new trend of co-designing data center applications along with older hardware. and um, so what we what we propose is that some tasks could be loaded to this dedicated hardware while keeping the most complex parts in general purpose CPUs. As you can see, well, this vision works. For example, we get a uh, four, order, four orders of magnitude in improvement in throughput by putting a Texas consensus protocol in the network. And we get a five times gain in power consumption by offloading uh, network functions to dedicated hardware. So this work in short is about uh, the opportunity to, off to offload MapReduce kind of tasks to stateful data planes. And um, we try to find the common requirements for these kind of tasks to perform well on programmable hardware. And um, we find out that these kind of data planes can achieve low latency and low congestion processing. And we first validate our approach through a first use case. So uh, first, some background. Uh, MapReduce is a programming model which was proposed by Google back in 2004. And um, basically what happens is that users define map and reduce functions. And its goal is to process huge amounts of data in a massively distributed fashion. Um, basically, newer programming models in the field of uh, data stream processing are no more than a superset of the MapReduce programming model. Um, uh, for the map phase, basically, uh, it processes a generic input and uh, generating an intermediate key value pair, which is then sent to the use case. So we have multiple map instances, each is receiving a split of the incoming data. Uh, well, the next reduce phase basically merges the intermediate values within the same key. And uh, of course, we have also multiple reduce instances, and each receives a partition of this, this key space. As a basic example, we can see here a word count, where we basically we want to count the 
occurrences for letters in the text. You can see them here. And they're basically split in, into the different map phases. And each map phase uh, produces an output of the key, which is the letter that it has seen, and the number one, because we're basically counting one occurrence for that letter, which is then sent to the next reduce phase, which basically performs a plus one operation for every key. And as you can see, in the end, we find the numbers of the numbers for each letter in, in, in the text. Um, so if we want to port uh, MapReduce on programmable hardware, we, we first ask, can we port any of these kind of tasks to, to networking hardware? And of course, there's no way in doing that. But what we can rather do is to identify a subset of meaningful and of loading amenable tasks to perform on data plane hardware. Um, Basically, one way, what we want to achieve here is a uh, low latency processing in the orders of nanoseconds and also very low variability. Uh, of course, uh, reducing congestion in these kind of scenarios and also freeing CPU cycle. Uh, so let's see, let's see some details. Uh, for the requirements, we think that uh, map phase uh, should restrict the possible key value pairs. Uh, what we know is that uh, this kind of hardware handles very well packet headers, and so our solution is to use a programmable parser in order to extract the possible keys and values from the, the packet header. For the reduce phase, um, we, we know that these devices must still perform at line rate, right? So very few operations are, are allowed. Of course, no loops are allowed, and uh, we need very small per flow memory footprints in the order of maybe two or three registers. And so associate having commutative operations like mean, mass, sum, or maximum, well, they're okay. And if we take a look at these two phases, we basically find out that the first phase is basically stateless. It's no more than a match action table. Uh, well, the second one is stateful because we actually have to keep memory of the, of the registers per each uh, different reduce flow. And so, um, what we ask ourselves is, if, is there already a ma hardware MapReduce executor? And it turns out we already have one, which is called Flowblades. And it was presented by my networking group at NSDI last year. And it is a, it is a stateful programmable data plane used by, as a, both for software and smart NICs as a network functions accelerator. Uh, it's basically a pipeline of stages, both stateless or stateful, which uh, Perform, performs uh, extended finite state machines functionalities. Uh, and in this case, uh, processing is, is restricted to a very few clock cycles. So in the orders of nanoseconds, which means six orders of magnitude better than the corresponding software executors, uh, which are bound to milliseconds. And we remind that many applications need strict time requirements. Uh, for example, in high frequency trading. So we think that uh, computing in the network sometimes may possibly be a key, a key enable for this, this kind of task. Um, you can see a flow blades overview here. It's basically uh, a pipeline of stages with different elements, which can be both stateless or, or stateful. Um, the question you may ask yourself is, why didn't they use P4? And well, actually, uh, MapReduce tasks uh, need per flow uh, state functionalities. And in P4, we have two ways to, to manage this. First one is the, the insertion, which is driven by the, the control plane. But uh, what happens in this case is that we have increased latency and also we have uh, some consistency issues between the packet arrival and the insertion of the rule for, for that specific flow. And or the other, uh, idea is the hash base selection. So basically, we select the, the index of our registers through, through a hash functions. But we, we don't get an, a universal way to resolve these kind of collisions, which is really use case depending. Well, uh, we chose Flowblades because it uh, manages to uh, handle collisions in a very transparent way for the, for the user. And also, I mean, we could have done this also in P4, but we, we chose this, this other path for, for this reason. Uh, talking about network placement for these devices, uh, 
we know that MAD, MapReduce really exploits parallelism on many different nodes, and uh, we propose the same architectures for our nodes in the network, for example, in data center topology in Petri. Uh, but what happens if uh, we have few hardware devices available? Well, we came out with two different solutions, and one is the reroute of the traffic to our flow blade instances, or we can use uh, our instance as a smart NIC endpoint for the communication, but of course, in this case, we're we're losing all the, the advantage of the in-network aggregation. So uh, we got some preliminary insights. Uh, we found out that clickstream HTTP traffic analysis from the literature. And um, what happens here is basically we have a map reduced task, snooping packets in the network and computing three different metrics, which are uh, the number of user sessions per TCP, per TCP user. We basically count the sessions and the average number of clicks per session in which we're basically counting the number of HTTP get requests per session and the average session duration. Um, what we use is our software implementation of, of flow blades and a traffic generator which is what's called T-Rex and runs on top of TCDK for uh, generating uh, high traffic at, in, a, in a 10 gigabit link. Uh, as you can see, uh, we wanted to see uh, the measurements about the workload scaling. We have load starting from 4K until 512K. And the parameters for these tests were uh, we had uh, 20 GET requests per session, and the average, average session time was 140 milliseconds. Uh, we saturated a 10 gigabit linking. We measured no losses, and our Blades instance was running on a single CPU clocked at 3 gigahertz. And um, as you can see, it correctly measures the, the metrics we, we wanted. We, we have the latency here in, in blue, the number of user sessions, which is here in green, and also the number of uh, clicks per, per session, which is still at, at, at 20 because we don't, we don't have any losses. And so uh, what we decided to do next is to downgrade the CPU clock cycle to 1.8 gigahertz because we wanted to, to measure some losses. And as you can see, um, the average session duration increases here with the, with the square dots in blue, both because of um, longer queue delays and because also we have some losses. Uh, and as you can see, also the, the average number of HTTP gas starts to increase here because um, between 32K and 64K because uh, we start to have to lose some packets, and so uh, get requests needs to to, to be retransmitted, and so we measure uh, higher metrics. Um, Marco, are you yeah. getting to the end? Yes, you are. Yeah, yeah. So for the future okay. work, we're planning to to integrate the our Excel tool chain, which basically is the tool chain we use to to program such devices in a MapReduce environment. We would like to implement uh, more and more applications. We would like to uh, execute this task on the same hardware concurrently. We would like to use our devices as basically a fun doing function as a service. And also we would like to further complete, compare Flowblaze and P4 through the P4 to net FPGA workflow. And so, yeah, that's it. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. I think for the sake of time, mm -hmm. uh, if there are, are there any questions? I haven't checked the, the queue. Uh, for the sake of time, maybe we want to put the, um, the questions uh, to the list or to, um, yeah, via email. Uh, thank you very much, Marco. And I think it shows uh, a nice application of, of uh, you know, putting more computing to do something that is useful. Uh, great. Uh, I know that we have uh, Jackson, the next uh, presenter. Um, before, we, before we start, um, is there someone who would be willing to take notes officially in the Etherpad? Uh, actually, I, um, Jeffrey is taking notes, and we're not. We're going. We're not going. You not know, he's the Etherpad. Down. Okay, no, the fine. Etherpad. Yeah. Um, no problem. As you know, I've I've had issues with Etherpad crashing. Um, so yeah, so Jackson uh, is online somewhere and uh, in the UK. And so uh, Jackson, uh, if you want to start your presentation. 
how do I how do I share my screen? Uh, there's a on the bottom. There's a button for mute. There's a button for video, and then there's a button for share. I see. Share. Con I got you. Screen. Uh, your entire screen. Okay, great. Um, uh, so P4 DNS is a uh, implementation of a DNS uh, within a P4 switch. Uh, and, and the idea is that uh, yeah, you know, it's a typical network computing idea. You, you bring the computation closer to the use to try and reduce the latency um, in particular, although, although we also found significant throughput improvements. Um, so we developed P4 DNS using P4 to net of PGA um, and found 53 times throughput improvement and 100 times latency reduction over a software-based uh, name server. Um, so we'll look at how we uh, how we did that and then find some areas where P4 um, is not particularly well suited for implementation of traditional applications on an FPGA. Um, so here's a data center network with some bits added to for uh, for a DNS. Uh, you know, I, the, you have a DNS request, and the first one goes all the way over the internet to uh, to the DNS server on the other side of the internet, uh, and then subsequent ones are accelerated to the DNS server. Um, and P4 DNS uh, just gets put in the in the rack on in, with the switch, uh, and the first request still has to go all the way over the internet, but subsequent requests can just get accelerated uh, within the rack. So uh, this so this is the architecture P4 DNS. Um, the data plane is in Lavender here. Um, it's written in P4 and implemented on an FPGA. Uh, the control plane is written in Python and runs on a host CPU. Um, the the idea is a packet comes in, we run some packet checks. Uh, you know, is it a DNS request? Uh, uh, if it is, uh, is it does it have the right number of uh, requests? Because P4 DNS only handles one request at a time. Is it is it an A record request or is it some kind of uh, MX request or something that we don't handle? Uh, that kind of checks to make sure we can actually handle it. Uh, and if it is, we forward it to we send it to a DNS table, uh, which looks up the DNS response and sends that to the normal switching functionality. Um, if it's not a DNS request, we just skip that and again, send it to the normal switching function. Then there are a couple uh, edge cases that we send to the control plane. Uh, you send uh, DNS responses, uh, plane so, that, so that the lookup tables can be updated and recursive requests are also sent to the control plane um, so that those can be executed in software and then the responses are forwarded back. The control plane handles the other, all the other immutability issues surrounding this. Uh, so it'll handle um, the table being overfilled in the data plane. It'll handle uh, TTL uh, updates. Um, and uh, and, and there, there are some issues surrounding this, particularly with the control plane becoming a bottleneck, because um, in, the, in this implementation, um, we've separated uh, P4 DN, uh, sorry, net, P4 to NetFPGA separates the mutability uh, into the data plane and control, uh, in, uh, leaving the data plane to do non-mutable things. Um, and so when we Jackson, the sound is very bad. Um, hmm. I keep cutting I, off. I keep cutting off. Hmm. I am not sure what I can do about that. Suddenly it's better. It's better now. All right. Well, let's, I'll keep on going and it's bad. Try and come up with something to fix that. Um, Alternative phone, like an analog phone line. No, um, I, I I have a cell phone. I I can call into this, right? If I have a number. Yes, 
we can. Right. I think right now it, it's 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 good. All right. Well, let's keep on going now. Tell, tell me if it gets bad again, and I will uh, sort out. Of... Uh, regardless, so so there's so separation of mutable state into the control plane um, rather than data plane works for some things, and it it works very well for uh, like the implementations of uh, routers and, and so on that really don't have very much uh, mutability. But when you start moving to application layer protocols where mutability is kind of central to, to a lot of their barriers, uh, memcached is something that comes to mind, uh, you, you know, where where really it's kind of, it is really you write to this thing and you expect it to change. And, and so mutability is kind of a core concept in it. Um, it doesn't work as well. We were finding that on our machine, the control plane was a significant bottleneck, uh, even even with the DNS protocol. Um, and then further to this, existing protocols are designed for software. So, so the example I have here is that DNS uses C style strings. Uh, of course, that's not quite right, but in effect, a DNS name in a packet is a nullated string. Um, and so the string length is clear until you've gotten to the last character. And this is okay in a software loop where you iterate over every single character um, and and you, maybe you count up how many characters in your string, and then you can malloc stir copy or whatever. That's okay. But in hardware, uh, it becomes much harder to figure out what the length of the string is without uh, without a, uh, you know, a length field telling you how long it is. And in P4DNS, we got around this issue because uh, we only support DNS request with a single domain name. And so if there is, uh, and so there is a name, then we know we can use the UDP packet length to figure out how long the domain name is. Um, and even then we don't support a very broad range of uh, domain name lengths. Um, now the conclusion here is, is that partial implementations can work because Although we don't support everything in P4DNS, and although we wouldn't expect to, P4DNS significant throughput and latency improvement over um, over a software-based name server, and in part that is because we aren't implementing everything. Um, I would not expect a full implementation of DNS to to perform anywhere near as well, even in hardware. Um, there were some other uh, limitations surrounding P4. One is the field length. Um, this isn't particularly relevant for DNS because uh, we would expect to be able to because uh, that's like a 40 character domain name, that, that's plenty. Um, but uh, for something, you know, maybe you have a 1024 bit hash that some, suddenly it starts looking a bit more like a restriction. Um, and secondly, we found that the complex parsing state machines were using excessive resources. So this is the state machine that P4DNS uses to parse incoming packets. Um, it's fairly simple. There's one, you know, there's basically one step at each, at each hop. Um, and uh, we have a branch to handle different lengths of domain names, but the reason we only handle two lengths of domain names is because uh, this state machine used up uh, basically all of our hardware resources. Um, when, as I said below, a simple bit stream would have been enough. I can understand, you know, it's very clear why in some cases you need a state machine that can do things like recursion if you want to be able to handle um, uh, uh, um, VLAN packets or, or uh, other types of nested pa packets can help. Um, but for a simple accelerator that is only to handle the common case of of exactly one sequence of of, um, of packet headers, we don't need this complicated uh, parsing state machine functionality. And and actually, like like it introduced a huge amount of hardware overhead on the FPGA. Um, and further, FPGAs remove some of the advantages of state machines anyways. Um, at least P4Net FPGA doesn't support uh, recursion in the in state machines to start with. In conclusion, an already integrated into a P4 switch uh, using P4Net FPGA um, and, and showed there was large potential for performance improvement, particularly with you know, partial implementations of existing protocols um, with some understanding of, of what the limitations of the hardware actually are. Um, but, you know, that, that these kind of traditional 
for implementation in hardware targets um, and that hardware targets are you know are, are not the cure for all um, for for accelerating every single case of, of a traditional software protocol um, that's all I have I'm happy to take any questions I think I've got a yeah, we have time for uh, one or two uh, questions. Thank you very much uh, for this, uh, Jackson. Um, you may know that we have a hackathon and we're looking for cool P4 stuff uh, once in a while. Uh, so this was nice. Uh, questions, anyone? So given these limitations, what next? Um, the, the promise and the limitations, <laughs> what next? <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd be very interested to see uh, what other protocols would would uh, what what limitations other protocols would run into. Um, so, we project, there was a, a parallel project that was going on, um, getting to work on or an edit um, had some success, um, but basically. The uh, difficulty of supporting variable field lengths even more limiting um, than, than we did. Um, so I think they they supported three three lengths of um, memcached fields um, and had significant difficulty. But largely, largely, it seemed to work fairly well. So yeah, I'd be interested to see what other what what limitations. Uh, other existing software protocols have on NetFPGA P4 or P4 and uh, what uh, and what limitations are inherent to P4 and what limitations could be solved with another um, compute paradigm. Um, actually, Tarlis is on the queue, and I should say we we can use the queue using the plus queue and the minus queue. I sort of jumped in. Uh, go ahead, Tarlis. Yeah, sorry if I overheard the answer to the question uh, during the presentation, but mm -hmm. are these limitations now specific to the net FPGA or would you experience them in the same or different fashion, let's say, in the x86 software uh, version of P4? Yeah, um, I believe that the field length, some, someone may be able to correct me, but I believe the field limitation is a generic p4 limitation and i think the complex parts of the machine I'm, I'm really not sure about uh it wouldn't surprise me that if the x86 implementation uh was slower using a machine then it would be just using a simple bit stream uh, but uh but i suspect it doesn't i mean it certainly wouldn't have the same problem of you on your computer, uh, you know, you can't fit it on your FPGA uh, that we ran into with with the larger state state machine. Of course, the, these ones the the discussion about traditional protocol would still apply. I suspect I'm not 100 percent sure. I haven't used the x86 um, P4, so I'm not 100 percent sure. Okay, uh, so thank you so much, uh, Jackson, for this. Um, next one is, uh, I think it's Edgar. Can you hear me? Edgar. Um, so uh, now we're moving from uh, like stuff that is really in the network to things that go a little bit closer to the edge. Uh, so um, Edgar, please. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay. So thank you, uh, Mario. So this is Edgar Ramos. I am uh, working in Ericsson Research in Finland. Um, I have been working with Roberto Moravito from Princeton, also Mario and, and Yves to um, take a little bit a step back and try to see the things from perspective lot so we are trying to to look at the whole continuous fabric of, of computation and uh, what would actually mean 
if we start to take in account uh, the whole um, the whole picture components together. So it's more like an architectural vision. And then we came out with this concept. But first, I would try to introduce what is the problem, and then a little bit uh, or thinking on, on this area and where where we, where it goes. So the third. First, a little bit about architectures in, for distributed computing in general. I mean, the, this is a picture that you are more, more than familiar in the sense that, that when we have a centralized architecture, so uh, basically we have a central cloud where we have applications that are connected to data or even processes that are in that central cloud. We have data sources feeding all the data in that centralized environment, which is basically an execution environment. And then uh, basically the idea is that everything is uh, needed to be controlled and connected in the cloud. So that means that if we talk about interoperability, well, basically what you need to, to, to take care is this binding. So how, how you actually uh, can interact with that cloud and whatever it happens here, well, it doesn't need to be so much interoperable with any other systems because basically you take care of everything here. Then um, if we move more towards what is happening nowadays, which is going towards the edge, then we end up with kind of decentralized um, architectures where we still have clouds, but uh, we call them today edge or fox or, or uh, you want to give and and then uh, they connect still to the to the data sources they also produce some of the execution and and then they might connect to to another central cloud which either in a hierarchical way or peer way uh, serving still applications and these applications uh, might also utilize uh, some of that edge resources as well so in a nutshell um, you, what we are doing is like sli slicing this this big cloud in smaller pieces, which requires now some additional interoperability because these clouds need to to talk to each other. They most probably need to distribute uh, processing between uh, themselves and then also share data. So then we are started to have a, a higher level of interoperability dependencies. And then finally we are. We could. This is arguable, of course, that that um, things are starting to be even more distributed, where the devices themselves they become execution environments. So think about a car, which is a self-driven algorithm running there. Especially because AI, it's it's becoming something that you need to uh, reduce the latency times. Uh, you need to also most probably for privacy reasons or even practical reasons. You cannot be moving data all the time everywhere. So the execution is done in the, in the end devices themselves. Also, these uh, data sources, they become even more atomic, like it could be parts of the subsystem. And uh, at the end, the applications themselves can be running in the same device. So, I mean, if we, we are talking about a self-driven car, so basically the application is, is driving and in that that is happening in the car. They could also uh, map into other peers as well. So basically we have a topology where everything gets mixed and then the interoperability here becomes really one of the problems. And then if we are starting to think about intelligence, like one of the, um, let's say the, the engines for this, it means that if I need to bring intelligence in each of these components, how can I do it in a way that is interoperable, that they can talk to each other, also that I can bring models that can operate in all of these uh, different domains and even different type of hardware and so on. So it becomes quite a big problem. Um, then if we think about this, uh, then we can start to, to, to talk about distribution of intelligence. And, uh, there are several aspects of this, and I will introduce them fast. So, what do you actually do intelligence? So, it might be that you want to compose things. So, you have one function that uh, do some type of analysis, 
another type of analysis. And then basically you have another function that put together the output of those and, and then give the final result. So some kind of uh, functional distribution. So that's the first thing that to, to keep in mind. Another one is the agent. So an agent can be uh, basically a self, um, you could say self-contained unit that can do things and, and has a, a, um, some sort of mission or goal. And then how they, how they can actually interact to each other. Is it a hierarchical model where you have a master which is ordering the others or they self-organize in a swarm way? Or it can be that they are a competition between uh, a certain agents and then, or there is a cooperation between those agents. So all, and then also most probably you want to have some control on that. Um, another thing is where that fund are executed. So as I was saying, sometimes you would be happy to have your break to be a break system, intelligent break system to be running in your car and not in the cloud, because it makes sense that the latency uh, that, that it takes that computation, uh, it, it is calculated in the car where it's supposed to be faster. Um, but then there could be cases where you need uh, some kind of cooperation with o o other systems, and then part of that intelligence has to be run it in clouds, or it can be run it even closer in, in each systems. Um, then the training of those systems is another, another dimension to take in account. So uh, if you are doing uh, some sort of um, function that it requires data, which is local, most probably doesn't want to, to extend that data further than the, 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 for the system, or is it not even useful for anything else that for the system where you are doing the, uh, for which one you are doing the training. Um, but then of course, uh, if you have facilities with many CPUs and many, uh, uh, I mean, a big data center, it might be that you want to run uh, training very fast. So there could be uh, um, also uh, situations where you want to do the training in, cent in center, uh, centralized uh, places. And then the final, final aspect of this distribution is like, how can you abstract or how you can take a, a, an AI function and then put it in a device and say, well, execute this. And, and then if we have, I mean, this is a little bit uh, different than the first presentation concept when we are saying that, well, what about if we have um, which you want to put functions uh, so that depending on the, the, the taking account, you are able to anyway process it. Of course, it might be cases where you want to have and when I mean genetic hardware, uh, 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 something like a TPU for acceleration, still I would call that, uh, in my case, a generic hardware because it would be something that you can put uh, in any device and then it could run any type of algorithms which has to do with AI. But uh, um, the idea is like, can you actually repurpose uh, the intelligence of a device without having to you know, change the whole, hard, uh, whole software and whole uh, system that 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 device was initially being um, designed for. In this case, for example, we have a human recognition, and you want to change it for I don't know animal recognition. Then we came out with this kind of uh, stacks. So basically, we can there is some kind of functional stacks of what we would like to um, achieve. And then there is a mapping of those, that stack to actually fit in an architecture. And then if we, if we see the functional st stack, what we like is like to have uh, communication and data, which is coming from sensing and tuition capability. So you can actually tell the things what it should do. Then you get the information for what you need to do. Uh, and then try to then transform that in knowledge that it can be contextualized, filter search, and uh, you could then, based on that, uh, fulfill a, a goal or a purpose or intention. And then the more we go higher in the stack, so the agent interaction is like separate on between different type of entities, which most probably they don't even know to each other from before. Imagine a car coming to a road and then how they have 
to it, right? and then that includes security and so on. So all this needs to somehow map to where these functions should be taken and how they should be uh, handled. Um, then there are several links. Edgar, yeah. for sake of time, maybe you want to uh, move maybe to the last slide. Yeah, OK. Um, just to finish this part, uh, there, there might be different levels of orchestration here. So this orchestration is mainly on data and, and processing. This is orchestration mainly in services and intelligence. We call it like that, lifecycle management, policies, and so on. Then we could also think about, I mean, if you if you see the previous uh, call or so, we, we, we could think about we we have data capturing and and then we have the communication and then how this is going to be communicated with still with a cloud environment using this this kind of uh, common data layer um yeah here is that uh, we cover everything uh, that it needs to uh, help the the system to talk to different uh, type of 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 uh, entities and then this edge computing can be of course more blocks together, but this is just an example. But uh, well, in summary, uh, the main challenges that we see is that uh, the interoperability between AI components and, and not only AI, also uh, everything that has to do with intelligence. So uh, because AI, I, I, I think is one type of, uh, is one of the challenges that we have. So how the agents can interact with each other. Um, I think this is re really clear also on the data layer where we have the, the different data types and then how to execute things, how to handle APIs, how to discover APIs, where the data is, and then the lifecycle management and policies. Um, so we think that with a kind of common intelligence data layer that could, if we added that to the architecture, that could solve many of the problems. This doesn't mean that this is a, a um let's say is something you have to introduce exactly equally or implemented equally everywhere but you could think the operative system where an operative system there are many flavors of them it can be implemented in many ways but still they map the same function there's an architecture that resonates towards all the different implementations of operative system and they can even talk between each other then uh, our next steps is basically uh, we will continue analyzing these interoperability requirements uh, and do try to do some kind of taxonomy architecture of this data layer, how it should look like, what are the components, what are the functions that should have. And, uh, and then start a draft on this, possibly with, with some legacy from the edge discovery, uh, edge data discovery draft. So hopefully we get a bit more uh, for the next. Uh, we have time for Thanks a lot. Um, so, um, we have time. This Carlos, who has a question, Carlos, uh, just a quick question. That was from the previous presentation. From the previous. Sorry, I didn't see. It was okay. So there's no questions. Are there any questions? Anyway, we have. We're running out of time, but okay. Um, yeah, thank you again, Edgar, and uh, thank you for putting that together uh, in a very short time. Um, uh, the next one is uh, Michael, and um, I will let you talk. Again, we're we're now moving into more, um, I would say, the data part and how we can move from current uh, implementations to more advanced models. So I will take, let you talk, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, this will be much more high level and I don't have any, you know, latency or throughput improvements or even there's only a little bit of control plane and data plane. But I, I want to talk about the intersection of the work we're doing in one data model, which is more about semantic interoperability of devices and, you know, IoT context. But extending that work to um, to provide some architecture support for network uh, computing and network function virtualization. So, um, yeah. okay. So, just briefly, what we're a liaison organization, and, and our goal is to harmonize the different semantic models. Uh, we find that there's a lot of commonality, but uh, you know, 
differences in uh, expression and, and sort of some of the details. So we want to try to harmonize those. And, and we've had some success in that. Initially, we're, we're building a language to and a meta model for, um, for expressing these semantic models. And, uh, but eventually, we want to have some converged set of models that a developer can just go pick and use and, and you know, derive interoperability through uh, certain encapsulation uh, techniques. So uh, our status is that we have a few standards organizations that we're working are working together. Um, and this is sort of where we've had some success in, in bringing these different organizations, uh, OMA, Lightweight, MTM, and OCF. And uh, we're beginning to enter a conversation with the, the Bluetooth SIG about uh, their models and um, eventually, you know, driving towards standardization, uh, possibly an IETF. But we've, we've already got agreements to share these models under open source permissive license using uh, the BSD template. And we, uh, we have a number of models already available and sort of in, in, a, in a prototype phase. And with CI and with some some schema checking, schema driven editing, and, and and a lot of developer support. What we want to um, uh, this is just just quickly what we're building is a meta model that has uh, some standardized affordances. And I'll talk a little bit more about how those work. Um, let's see, and we we want to um, extend the work. Initially, we're working mostly on characterizing and describing what IoT devices do because that's sort of a a pain point in the industry right now, but we we're, uh, want to very quickly follow that up with the the big the next big gap, which is modeling uh, behavior and context. And I think this sort of this is where the intersection is really with uh, network computing. So our meta model briefly is that we we encapsulate things in objects mostly, and we allow objects to be composed into bigger things, and that's how we model devices. But uh, the important thing about objects is they they have these affordances that we we model um, properties actions and events which happen to line up really well with the way uh, the uh, interfaces are already designed in a lot of iot devices and a lot of iot services and then we have some reusable data types uh, so that's really a big point of interoperability also is sort of the, the semantics around the data type so um, this is an example of the language. It's a JSON-based language that looks sort of like some uh, config files do, but you create these definitions for objects, properties, actions, events, and things. And here's an example of a switch object and a value property on off being defined and actions and to turn on and off. And then the switch would, of course, be composed into uh, more complex things like light bulbs that have on off along with other affordances. And so what we end up with is, you know, modeling a thing with a set of objects inside that thing, sort of as an encapsulation, and those uh, collectively create the set of affordances that that thing exposes. Properties, actions, and events. And this is the current uh, focus of one data model in the SDF language is to be able to express these. But where we can extend things and sort of taking a little bit of a, a cue from industrial controls in IEC 61499, um, basically we can create a model of a function block using the same affordances, properties, actions, and events coming in. In other words, uh, it subscribes to properties or it reads and writes properties. Um, it, it can have actions done upon it, sort of like function calls, and it can do actions on other objects, function calls, and then it can receive events and it can generate events. Um, the idea here being that you would create then a network application by wiring these things together, almost sort of in a graph. Um, you can imagine that that's the way 61.499 works as well. So the properties that are data properties from one function can go to another and actions can be um, invoked from one function block to another, and events can be propagated from one function block to other. And then you can have you know, communication protocols in between, such as pub sub and one to many and, and many to one and one to one patterns like this in the, um, in the graph. And that's, that's mainly the, the bulk of the idea. What we would 
do is um, create a function block class that provides some semantic anchor there. And the uh, affordances would need to be characterized as input and output affordances uh, to, to create a model that, that looks like this. And then we'd have to, or would like to add behavioral constructs so we can describe what's happening inside. And of course, you could just have program inside, you know, you could have C code or whatever, but you could also have some formal definitions of state machines and logic, logic and rules, uh, scenes and settings for, for um, home automation and things like that, and then industrial control algorithms. And also just for general computing, it could be stateful or, or stateless, um, such as the MapReduce and, and uh, you know, implementation of you know, what are generally called Lambda functions. Uh, the, the interesting thing is this is just an abstract model. It, it basically allows you to say, here's a function and here's what it does and here's what its inputs and outputs are, but um, it doesn't really say how it works on a network. So there's the idea of another layer in the system that's protocol binding where we define things like content formats and payload formats, the things that go over to the network, do they go at one at a time or in bulk, um, how the protocols are used, pub sub, rest protocols, uh, what are the network addresses of instances of things, URLs, <clears throat> so you can actually start building a, a, a network. And uh, some examples of this are the like a W3C thing description, which provides uh, both uh, semantic anchor points as well as formats and protocol descriptions. And of course, open API or Swagger people are familiar with. So these, these can be tools that can map the model to a particular protocol or set of instances on a network. So well, what's missing, of course, you know, security considerations. How would you make such a system secure? How do you manage it? How do you configure or discover things, uh, configure things? It's more maybe configuration than discovery, how to build these application networks. And then instrumentation and diagnostics, how do you identify cycles and how do you know when things are going wrong and how do you optimize performance, things of that nature. So, you know, what we're, where we're at now with, with one data model in SDF is a set of initial deliverables that we've uh, committed to, to deliver back to the participants um, to use in their, in their work, but also to standardize SDF so that it can have a much, much broader impact. And, um, and then we have queued up to work on these behavior and context extensions. We talked a lot about behavior and then the idea of context is, of course, being able to say what these things influence in the real world. So in industrial controls, it would be uh, a, the level of a, a liquid in a tank or flow rate in a pipe or whether a pump is running or not, something like that. And that's really this, you know, half-baked idea or partially unbaked or whatever. But um, for more information on what we're doing, you can go to the GitHub. We're, we're not fully public, but we, we do have a public GitHub and, and we do invite uh, review and comment. So with that, um, I don't know how we're doing on time. We have some time. So we it's made actually up. good. Um, thank you very much. And again, thank you also for, for doing this um, at the last minute. Kind of threw this together, right? So um, it's yeah. not, it, again, it's not fully baked or anything, but I, I saw a, a good, and was speaking with Eve and saw a really good intersection here. And I think that there might be some. some uh, it's good intersection with the previous presentation also. Eve, you have a question? I mean, I wanted to point out that, you know, I know that there's some intersection between folks who are listening, obviously, you know, Ari and Karsten are very involved in the thing to thing and wishy um, workshop outcomes. And, you know, one D I see sort of one DM as um, an out a really wonderful positive outcome of that. So, yes, there's some cross pollination, but when Michael told me that he was thinking about this, I couldn't help but think of some of the work going on with main function networks uh, and with rice the, you know the, the icn um, implementation that you know marshals compute in the network um, in addition to routing data by name you know how do you um, in some ways invoke 
these functions or function blocks. And while it's not necessarily, they're not necessarily thinking about the linguistic part of it or the interoperability part of it, that was where I saw, personally saw the overlap. So I was really excited to hear that my, <laughs> Michael was thinking about this and, and thought that at least folks involved in those kinds of developer concerns of how do you begin to specify um, what's needed as, as the IO for these functions. I, I was hoping that people could weigh in from their, from these diverse backgrounds of experiences, you know, is, is the, uh, is this direction for SDF um, something that we can uh, both influence and be influenced by? Go ahead, Karsten, I can see you want to answer this question. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure that, that I'm ready to answer all those questions, but I wanted to point out that actually the, the next weeks uh, we will have a number of meetings where we, we will talk about these things and not actually just talk, uh, but actually implement things. Uh, so uh, right on Thursday, we are going to have a, a far hour wishy hackathon uh, where we are looking at, at ways to get uh, implementations that use different data models uh, together using a one data model uh, a proxy in, in the middle as, as the exchange point or red star, as, as we occasionally uh, call it. And uh, then next week we're going to have, uh, when is that? Can someone remind me? Day of the week is it? Yeah, it's on Tuesday. Uh, we're going to have a Think to Think research group uh, a a meeting uh, where we will talk about 1DM and in particular uh, we will have some introduction into the, the data model um, uh, specification language as it is defined uh, now and, and that is actually something that, that is sufficiently crystallized at this point in time that it actually could move out of research in, into the IETF. Uh, so th there are lots of things going on here that, that uh, really are moving very fast. And so we're hope we're hoping that this is just the beginning of um, closer uh, communication between these efforts. So you said the Wishy Hackathon is on the ninth, is that Friday? No, Thursday, and the yeah. and the um, the thing to thing meeting is on next Tuesday, which is the twelfth. Yes. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Um, okay, so now we we go to the. Uh, presentations for the me? yes question from uh, me oh, yeah. uh, to Michael. Uh, Michael, are you going to 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 post a draft on, on that? Um, so, sorry, you mean an internet draft? Yeah. Yes. The uh, the plan is um, some throughout this month. And, you know, based on our, our collaboration to prepare an internet draft for the SDF language to, to shop it around and, and, and look at uh, standardization and IETF. Okay, good. Yeah, because, uh, so, so, sorry for my question, I was not listening carefully. <laughs> you didn't exactly say that, so it wasn't exactly clear. Yes, that, that is exactly the thing. And when you circulate it in thing to thing, definitely think about um, CCing Cohen RG. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, so um, now we go to the next phase, which is, um, oh my God. My... Okay. Uh... Um, yeah, so. Um, Next presentation is the drafts, and I lost my my agenda, so things are not going well here. Hold on. Um, so first draft presentation yeah, yeah. is Dirk. Dirk. Yes, I've been yes. trying I was to, going talk to say it's Dirk. I can't find where the Dirk, Dirk has been. Dirk has been um, online for a while, so Dirk, it's yours. Yes, hi. Um, hope you can hear me. Um, I just realized. Uh, when trying to share, um, I have to use the browser because my uh, WebEx installation um, got corrupted and the browser doesn't support sharing. 
can you, while you could maybe share it from your side, I sent the slides before. Um, Eve, do you have the slides? Uh, yeah, let me see, let me find them and share them. Oh, sorry, but I should have tried it earlier, but when I clicked on the button, it just said, browser doesn't support sharing. And let me attempt to share. Network, I think this is it. Okay, let's make this big. Oops. Okay, how's that? Very good, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is an update to the first draft. I know in the list that Jeffrey showed before, um, there was still version 01, we updated that a couple of weeks ago to 02. Um, so they, they, that's the latest version that's been up. Um, so by my former colleague um, and another project partner he used to work on. Um, and I just want to give a, a quick update on what we've changed uh, compared to the last presentation. The first version, the 00, zero version, was presented in Montreal. So tell me, year. am I supposed to be on the next slide? What slide am I supposed to be on? Um, uh, yeah, no, no, I'll, I'll tell you when it's next. Uh, uh, we first presented this in, in Montreal. I couldn't make it uh, to Singapore. Um, so so we, we, we jumped one there to get to the next one, please. Mm -hmm. Is it behaving? Page down. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, what other? Hang on. I don't know why it's. I can see the hands of the of your derby. Yes, I can see that too, but I for some reason I'm um oh. Oh, yeah. yeah, it is. Very good. Thanks. Right. Yeah, this is copied from the introduction. Um, we, we, we're kind of like um, going with a term here that we call app tender, which is part of the um, title of the draft. And we're focusing very much in the draft on uh, application centric microservices that are being executed in different parts of the network. Um, that's kind of like the, the um, premise of the draft. And the outline use cases and research challenges for the vision. And you can see this if you could go to the next one, please. Um, I do not know why I, my computer does not want to respond. To this. There is. Oh, yeah, there it is. Computer. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I think I'll, right. okay. Now I think I've got the controls. I wasn't sure what this application was taking as controls. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Thanks, and sorry for putting you on the spot. No um, what we've changed since the last time. So we changed since last time, but okay, so we added uh, more use cases um, in the uh, section three, which you can see here on the structure. And we pulled the requirements, which were before scattered in the use cases into a separate section, which is 3.6. Um, we also had some minor revisions um, on the energy technologies um, and the challenges of these in, in various areas. I don't know exactly why our table of content doesn't actually show the subsections there. Um, we have pulled out, I think, four or five at the moment. Uh, but we plan more um, to focus on the, in the next version will be action on, on section four. But um, that's kind of like a change there. I wanted to briefly walk through the through the use cases and then very briefly flesh the requirements as we have them. Um, that's kind of like it because there's only a, a draft update. If you could go to the next slide, please. We had already the mobile function offloading, which we presented originally in um, uh, in Montreal, which, which, uh, um, and we also initially actually wanted to demonstrate um, in uh, the meeting in Vancouver that didn't happen. Uh, there's a demo available for that where we use, you know, um, a microservice structure of mobile applications that's backward compatible with current Android applications uh, to distribute the microservices across several devices. All of them are shown on the right hand side as data centers, but these data centers in quotes could just be a mobile camera or a smart TV, you know, but it also could be an edge micro data center. Uh, could you speak that, louder? Sorry, yeah, I'm on my mobile, unfortunately, because also the... Oh, but that's better. better. Yeah. yeah, okay, good, good. I'll keep it a bit closer. Um, the drivers are the lines of peripherals, um, you know, multi-surface uh, uh, VR, multi VR, VR. They have a number of um, dedicated use cases in that area where these microservices just bounce about based on the interaction in the um, um, in the user experience. 
and could be really a number of mobile apps. Um, uh, multi viewing experiences was our first one that we started with. Multi user gaming is another one that's really quite interesting. We also had a demonstration last year on localized tourist experiences where some of the functionality is being transferred um, again to an edge data center. And some of the pain points that we've experienced there, which we then discussed separately in section four, is the lack of a, uh, a, a available platforms for HTTP US microservices. There are a number available, but you know, they're, they're, they're the differences between them. The latency that's often caused, the very, in particular in bad implementations, when every HTTP request is essentially encapsulated with a TCP uh, 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 reset up, uh, which, which you can see in some implementations actually, as well as the chaining overhead um, that is being caused when you chain microservices together into a chain of interactions, and some of the typical pain points. To go to the next uh, one, which is our year one, we all said it's something on distributed AI, and that is to um, utilize distributed computing power to increase the compute capabilities as one goal. So you just, you know, you just get more power. The other one um, is a different set of scenarios, sometimes maybe even combined, is localized data and reasoning, and that in particular in the in, in the EU, but also in other privacy regimes, allow you to localize the reasoning of a sensitive data and to sometimes make better to keep data reasoning um, in certain execution points in the network. A number of examples um, that we start working with, the, the more about the localized processing, is more about things like RAND processing or radar-like applications for topological mapping, but then also others, um, and where also the privacy aspect comes in is uh, large-scale image recognition, where the feature extraction is being localized, um, uh, uh, and then only uh, the Actual application only acts over the features rather than the dedicated raw data. So again, the pain points here are very similar: latency as well as the chaining, um, but also the integration of rich processing endpoints that are nowadays not necessarily cost hardware. Things like a base station is a reasoning, essentially a reasoning platform that you could use in a in a in a, in a cellular environment, uh, and and these uh, processing endpoints are very often very proprietary still. Go to the next slide, please. Um, CDNs is the network level uh, service we, we, we uh, presented as a use case in there as well that, uh, that uses multicast opportunities and pathways forwarding to improve on the distribution within the CDN, but also towards customers. On the right hand side, you can see one customer at the bottom left and the number of CDN nodes being provided in various customer access networks. Uh, and obviously the drivers here is a significant increase in the media content, so you just have more and more content being pushed about. And the examples um, are the obvious ones in uh, PDNs and converge 5G, um, utilizing technologies like 5G LAN to also connect to mobile nodes um, in, out there in the field, and, but also increasing on, uh, improving on existing CDN solutions and fixed access. These are um, the two typical examples. The pain points obviously there is the efficiency both in network utilization in the back end of the front door between, between the CDNs and to the user, as well as the CDN server cost in serving the, um, the content. And obviously also the, the latency that's caused by inefficient uh, path length or path stretch and the DNS redirection to the CDN. Storage capacity is another pain point, and particularly when, when you want to trade off storage capacity against network utilization in scenarios where you use storage constrained edge nodes, how often can you refresh the actual edge nodes and trade off the network utilization against the storage capacity. Put a couple of references that are also, um, I think, not, I'm not sure the, the research report, but um, the archive uh, paper should be in the draft as well. I realize today that I probably don't have the market report in there. Um, this is the, next, the last one, please. The last use case, we, we, we look at it from an infrastructure perspective, and that is, you know, we call this compute fabric as a service, and that is to build a multi-technology data center-like connectivity across a number of access technologies for value-added use cases that can be really, you know, a number of or any type of uh, data center-like app that's being implemented over the actual compute fabric. Uh, and the, the driver series really building infrastructure that's application agnostic, but it utilizes the benefit of available local compute resources. That's kind of, in a way, a real estate play. If I can be uh, more local than maybe somebody else, I get certain advantages in terms of latency, maybe, or in terms of localization of computation, because I have the real estate available. I target the number of players I've been working in uh, with in the past 
and when we started writing the graph that work very much in the data center interconnect uh, um, uh, area that really go after this type of real estate play. Um, the pain point here is, is, is um, that we identified has to do with technology uh, topology changes um, to enable service changing and forwarding when these topics actually changes in some of the scenarios, for instance, or in smart cities or in uh, well, in heat uh, the, the the actual compute traffic might be changing because of uh, of certain ability aspects or volatile resources that are being utilized from the far edge. Uh, and that leads to dynamic additional resources, uh, um, which allow us to really add resources um, in a in a dynamic, you know, uh, you know, bidding way to the actual uh, to the actual compute fabric. Good. So uh, as I said, we described these um, use cases in a little bit more detail in the um, uh, in the draft uh, and pulled out a number of use cases. You go to the next slide, please. Um, that cover various areas. So I haven't actually listed them all. I tried to do that, but I ended up on having uh, five or six slides. And um, I, I refer to these slides there. They have various areas that cover oops, that cover service routing, service chaining, the execution pinning, service packaging, synchronization. So they all link back to the actual use case. Some of the requirements obviously apply to two or three use cases there and then being used to the first in, in order. Um, but there are various things. There's no claim of them being exhaustive, but there are a number that we teased out. Um, what's missing uh, is now, that's in the future plan, if you go please to the next one, is the next slide, please. I know, I'm clicking my button, but it's not doing anything, <laughs> so <laughs> oh, frustrating. It's, it's not much on the other one, I can actually read this. So the future okay. plans we actually have for that is to extend, now turn to section four, um, one of the backgrounds there is, is that I changed company, my affiliation changed in the, in, in the, in the draft, and that's one of the reasons why I didn't have that much time to spend on the research challenges. Um, that's the next step in the next version of the um, draft, uh, and in particular linking them more clearly to the requirements and to the use cases to, to, to make a better cross linkage throughout the document. Um, not sure this will already come in the next one, but also it links to one of the chart writers that was listed before by Marie Jose, is to outline high level solutions, both existing but also under research and development. So, do we at least give some type of, I put it in quotes, maybe in air quotes, survey of you know, what's currently available that could, you know, could really be utilized for realizing some of these use cases and then potentially even lead to a gap analysis as to what is furthermore required in terms of solutions. So that's the plan for the next Look at that. There it is. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Finally. Good. That was it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, anyway, there's there's no questions in the queue, but for sake of time we'll we'll go to the next one, uh, which is um that was a great update. Thanks, Dirk. Yeah, thanks Dirk. Um thanks, thanks for sharing. Uh, you know, I'm trying to share. I'll stop sharing now. Uh, Ina, this is uh, you now uh, on security. Yeah. Yes. It, uh, yeah. So this is you now, and uh, I think it's an important uh, presentation because uh, security was um, something that the IAB had um, seen as an issue for this group. So please. Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you and hello, everyone. My name is Ina Fink and I'm a PhD student from RWTH Aachen University. So last year, my colleague Ai Kunze already presented a draft about how in-network computing can generally enhance industrial networks, especially regarding processing. And we also see a lot of potential for in-network computing to benefit security and privacy that I want to present today. Our draft targets cyber-physical systems in general, but I will focus on the example of industrial networks in the following. And yeah, with the rise of the industrial internet of things, industrial devices are increasingly connected to the internet. But here we have the problem that those are often legacy devices, not designed to be accessed from outside the local network. Thus, even, even simple security mechanisms are often missing. And furthermore, we have sensitive processes and data which is sent unprotected over the internet. 
As a consequence, we need to um, retrofit security and privacy mechanisms, and here we see the potential of in-network computing to do so without significant overhead. And yeah, more precisely, we present, uh, we propose basic protection mechanisms as well as intrusion and anomaly detection to be implemented in networking devices. I start with encryption and integrity checks, and this is actually the example with the least current feasibility if we take existing hardware into account, since complex cryptographical operations are just not possible at the moment with existing programmable networking hardware, which was not of interest until now. However, confidentiality and integrity are critical, and so we think that we should at least consider the theoretical opportunities given by in-network computing for this. And yeah, here we have the idea to implement encryption and the calculation of, she of checksums just at the networking device closest to each industrial device. And then decryption and checks can be done at the networking device closest to the receiver or at the receiver itself in case of, for example, general purpose computers. In this way, the data can be sent between uh, those networking devices or to the receiver um, uh, yeah, in a protected manner, um, again, yeah, uh, without unnoticed access. Okay, um, yeah. Given this potential, we should further examine the opportunities as well as the interest of the manufacturers for such technology. And we should also evaluate the costs and the trade-off for keeping future networking hardware with according cryptography. Features. Okay, um, what is already feasible, in our opinion, is to implement authorization and authentication mechanisms. And here we have a clear advantage of in-network computing that it allows to make elaborate decisions about whether packets should be forwarded or not. In detail, um, we see two possible approaches here. So, First, a communication partner trying to connect to an industrial device could be required to conduct a handshake um, for authorization and authentication at the start of every connection. And here, yeah, this could be done on the basis of passwords or certificates. And cryptographic calculations could be offloaded to the control plane as they are only needed once for every connection. The decision would be then enforced by the networking devices without further processing overhead. The second idea would be to send secret tokens with every packet, which are then checked for their validity by the networking devices. And for this, we could, for example, use hash chains to prevent replay attacks. Um, and simple hashing is already possible within existing uh, networking hardware. So, reinitialization of, uh, of the hash chains could then be again offloaded to the control plane. In this way, in-network computing could easily decrease the attack surface. Next and similar is the enforcement of policies at networking devices. And you probably know the manufacturer usage description, which is a proposed standard for defining the communication behavior of smart devices. In turn, all other communication, including malicious behavior, can be locked out. Um, and we think this concept can be easily transferred to industrial devices as they usually show a very function specific behavior and restricted communication as well. In fact, uh, in network computing is ideal for enforcing such policies as it allows very flexible filtering at line rate. And in contrast, existing approaches, for example, software defined networking with open flow lead to unacceptable latencies. Furthermore, in-network computing can be also used to consider additional information like contextual parameters, uh, like the time of day, or even packet contents, instead uh, just using simple protocol header fields. Um, first proofs of concept for this are already existing by other researchers, uh, but the full potential of this remains subject to future Last, we can also imagine to implement privacy mechanisms in networking devices. So in cyber physical systems and in industrial systems, we have a close entanglement with the physical world. 
and a lot of sensitive data is collected and processed. And this data is also increasingly shared with other manufacturers to enhance processes. However, some of this data might be too sensitive to be shared without any concealment. And here we see again the potential of inertware computing to do so in an uh, efficient manner. Um, the simplest example here um, is pseudonymization. For this, we can just remove or replace critical values. But we can also imagine to aggregate values of multiple packets and then just forward the result or to add noise to single values to decrease their accuracy. However, for all of these cases, we need to conduct further research and implement proofs of concept to clarify if and how effective realization is actually possible. Okay, now, having named those basic protection mechanisms, attacks might be too subtle to be prevented up front. However, they can lead to noticeable effects in the long run. And um, yeah, furthermore, devices might act faulty even without external interference. Here, we think that inertware computing can help again to detect such male behavior. And the advantage here is that with inertware computing, we can, we can on the one hand use flow statistics to detect anomalies in, uh, in traffic patterns. But additionally, we can use um, the multitude of sensors which are deployed in industrial networks as those values um, are passing the networking devices. Thus, we can Tina, observe. Yeah. Are you close to the end? Yeah. Any issues here? Yeah, I'm close. Um, yeah, so uh, with the sensors, we can also observe the environment and quickly detect malfunctioning. And then the network administrator can be notified. But furthermore, we can extend traditional deadman switches um, and, yeah, for example, implement automatic triggering of emergency shutdowns or isolation of system components. Um, okay, so to conclude very quickly, uh, we see multiple opportunities for in-network computing to efficiently benefit security and privacy. Um, by this, we could reduce the costs for additional hardware and also processing overhead, which is especially beneficial for time-sensitive contexts and also for resource-constrained devices, which we cannot easily upgrade. Um, yeah, in the future, we want to examine the potentials and details, uh, and challenge, no, the potentials and challenges in detail, um, design first architectures, and also implement proofs of concept. However, we are still at the beginning of this research, and um, yeah, so we are strongly interested in your opinions and input, and also, and possible collaboration. So thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your comments. Uh, thank you very much. I think questions to the list. Yeah, um, sure. So if anybody has comments, uh, again, please do the list. And we'll move very fast to the next presentation, which is uh, well, the, trans the next one is transport, I think, right? That's me. Go ahead. So, then let's right get in, uh, get into it. So today I will be talking about the updates that we've done uh, about our transport issues draft um, from the version that Klaus presented in Singapore to now. Um, so, um, what we for an overview, we have first uh, tried to make the section about addressing a little bit more concise. So there was a lot of unnecessary wording uh, that we've kicked out. Um, then in section four regarding authentication, we've actually included the proof of transmit, uh, transit um, proposal of the service function chaining working group uh, as a hint uh, that was given uh, from Diego Lopez, I guess, um, into uh, the section there as a potential yeah, solution to the problem, or at least one step in the right direction. And then finally, as the main focus of our uh, changes, we have spent a little more time on um, yeah, the advanced transport features, where we are now um, yeah, actually talking in subsections about uh, reliability and flow and congestion control. And uh, still, our intention of the draft is to raise questions. So we 
some of them might be a little bit far-fetched, but we think they are worth uh, yeah, asking. And um, yeah, so that we all have in mind what could be possible things that one can think about. And in the following, I would like to um, yeah, quickly get over or I'll go over um, yeah, aspects that we think are worth mentioning about real, uh, reliability and uh, flow and congestion control. So uh, this was a slide that Klaus used in, in Singapore, um, where we basically have a, a setup um, source and a, a destination with a lot of uh, coin elements in the middle where we do a lot of processing. And now a packet on the right side gets lost. And now the, the basic question that Klaus raised in, in Singapore was whether um, the retransmission should be triggered from the sender as is current standard or whether, um, for example, the last successful position, in this case, then switch four should trigger the retransmission um, because otherwise we would have to repeat all the um, computation steps in between. Um, based on yeah, th this question, we then thought about um, other problems or challenges that might be there and we then kind of had a hierarchical uh, steps where each of the later challenges or question depends on whether we ask, answer the previous questions uh, in a certain way. So the first, first thing that we were thinking about is um, that um, the retransmissions generally are based on the end-to-end -end principle still. So this means that uh, the sender only retransmits if it has determined that the uh, receiver didn't get the original message. And then both the, the sender and the receiver know that a retransmission is incoming or that a packet uh, is missing, and then they can act accordingly. But now we have yeah, like coin elements in the middle, and they now um, also yeah, somewhat work on the, on the messages that are uh, transmitted. And now the question that we are raising here as a first step is whether they also should have uh, an understanding of the basic retransmission uh, mechanism. So should they know that uh, we are now sending retransmissions uh, through the network uh, or not? And um, yeah, first step, if we answer that question with a yes, uh, would then be uh, to build this understanding based on the existing transport mechanisms. Uh, but here it could be challenges, uh, challenging to find uh, for the coin elements to actually identify that we are, uh, well, that they are working on retransmissions. And that's we are then thinking about whether we could, uh, for example, then have like dedicated uh, signals for the coin elements that they can more easily detect that a uh, retransmission is going on. And especially if we have then somewhat of a coin capable transport, um, this could then be more easily to uh, realize. Um, yeah, then if we now think that um, coin elements should be able to yeah, uh, identify retransmissions, then the next question is whether they should also be able to yeah, incorporate them into their computations because retransmissions are sent out of order. And as such, uh, if we have, um, for example, the TCP stream and the coin elements have to process that stream um, missing a certain packet, which is then retransmitted later on, needs the coin element to yeah, store all the information that is next uh, essential for the computations until the later point when the retransmission arrive, uh, arrives. And thus, it is yeah, kind of a crucial decision here whether we should uh, allow them to incorporate the retransmissions uh, into their uh, computations. Um, then the other side of the metal, so we're now talking about identifying retransmissions. On the other hand, if we um, need retransmissions, then packets get lost. And thus the logical other side of the metal is um, to ask whether coin elements should also be able to find out that a packet is missing so that they can then include that into their com uh, computations and, for example, then wait uh, with computations until a later point when the retransmission arrives. Um, and then also directly then the next step, if they are able to identify um, that a packet is missing, should they then also be uh, capable of requesting or performing retransmissions themselves? So actually this was would then be the initial question that uh, Klaus raised in, in Singapore. 
Um, and yeah, depending on how we answer these questions, um, the coin elements might have to store uh, fewer or more transport state, uh, which could definitely become a challenge at some point. Um, yeah, then the next question that we had, or the next thing that we had was, were similar questions uh, of who is in charge, and there we mentioned flow and congestion control as uh, potential uh, other uh, examples. And yeah, in general, flow and congestion control are mechanisms that avoid overloading of certain things. So flow control avoids overloading receiving and uh, receiving hosts. Congestion control avoids overloading the network. And while flow control bases on explicit end host information, the congestion control only has volatile feedback from the network. And if we now think of our coin elements, they are somewhat in the middle, so they are entangled with the computation, so somewhat of a receiving host, but they are also, uh, at least if we're thinking of switches, then they are in the network. And as such, they then uh, introduce loss and delay to our communication. And the end host will interpret that as network congestion, and as such, that will also be then uh, accounted for in the congestion control. But if we now think of uh, loss-based congestion control like Cubic, for example, um, and host will repeatedly overload our coin element if our coin element is at least the uh, bottleneck of the connection. And thus, um, we yeah, overload it even if we know that there are hardware or uh, computation limits of it. And thus, we are asking whether we should, similar to flow control, do something like um, a resource reservation step in, uh, in advance or integrate it into end-to-end uh, -end flow control, like, uh, so that we can, yeah, know in advance that we won't overload um, the computational capacities that we have in the network. Um, our future plans, I've also added the industrial use cases draft on this slide. Um, so for the transport issues, um, we are, yeah, now, asking you whether we've missed some aspects or questions that should still be raised. Um, also, if some of the problems that we've raised need additional clarification. Um, so feel free to give us feedback on that. And then regarding uh, the industrial use cases draft, there we find it very hard to get hard numbers uh, for the use cases, so on the uh, requirements that are there. Um, so it is a little bit difficult to further advance the draft. And additionally, the draft is, uh, as the initial slide of Marie Jose showed, um, attached to the milestone that is now happening. And thus, we would also raise the question how we would like to um, proceed with this draft in the future. And yeah, that's it from my side. Okay, again, we're really getting out of time, so we'll move discussions on this, which I think is an important discussion um, to the list. Um, we have, you know, I don't mind going over time uh, if people have have a, um, you know, a, a timing issue, uh, please leave when you can. We have still two presentations, so I think we could go about 10, 15 minutes over time, which is fine for me, and, you know, we can let go of the uh, last part. So we have two presentations. Next is Peng from China Mobile, who uh, could not present last time because we were out of time. So uh, Peng, if you could present and try to go fast, so we have time also to allow Eve to present the update on her draft because she was also thrown out because of no time last time. So um, management problem. <laughs> yeah, we have time management issues. Uh, I, I think, yeah, we're popular. So please, uh, Peng, uh, again, please go fast because, you know, you, yeah, please. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay, hello? We hear you. Go. I can see your slides. Okay. Uh, okay. This is Peng from China Mobile and it's about the requirements of computing in the world. And so after the last we had a discussion and thanks for those who Give suggestions, and we consider the requirements of some new service and the categories requirements into network computing and management. Um, and the network, including the um, precision on current 
uh, addressing an information interaction and the computing requirement includes uh, deployment, discovery, and uh, scheduling. And the management includes um, cross domain management and the joint opti optimization. Uh, okay, so um, for the uh, network requirement, uh, the pre-theorem we consider that it's not for all of the service, um, but some of the some of the new service, uh, uh, like motion control in the uh, manufacturing, um, and uh, some electric service will uh, require one to ten microsecond response. And uh, um, for the concurrency, we see there will be numbers of uh, computing nodes deployed in the network or computing functions integrated in the network device. So it will bring a great challenge to the uh, network connection. And uh, addressing information requirements, which are not, uh, not not new in this version. So we just uh, um, some some skip skip this. And um, for this version, uh, we give something uh, new is that add some computing. So uh, one is deployment, and we think if some uh, computing task in the network is guaranteed to be in play, we need to consider about what kinds of chips and web should them be deployed. On the other hand, um, different kinds of computing require different kind of chips. And so um, we all know, for example, about AI algorithms, and they may be distributed in several uh, uh, and the second is the discovery. Uh, after the um, deployment, networks need to have the ability to discover computing resources. And when there are computing tasks to be computed, the network can reasonably allocate uh, resources according to the needs of the application. And scheduling is uh, mentioned uh, was mentioned in the last time. Uh, it's about uh, scheduling strategy because the service node may be changed when the service are being run. Uh, and for the management department, uh, we consider more about the joint op uh, optimization, uh, uh, which, are which is mentioned in other draft directions of uh, computing network. So. <clears throat> We consider uh, it's maybe be important about it, and the cross domain um, management. Uh, we think uh, some service may go through a long network and the network domains, so there may be some problems to think. Excuse me, you're fading out. Uh, you're almost impossible to hear. Can you try to get closer to your microphone? Thank you. And that's my slides. And next, next step, uh, we think more analyze about the requirements proper um, proper definition according to the different scenarios. And some offline discussion are welcome. That's all for my slides. Okay, thank you again. Um, thank you for this. Um, like there was comments and I think you addressed some of them. Um, and I think we'll continue the discussion on this. Uh, Eve. Okay. The right one. Hang on one second. Um, I'm just trying to find the right window. Many windows. Do the, as fast a summary as I can. Okay. Uh, this is a draft that um, has, we began it about a year or so ago and have had several updates. Uh, it's actually on version three, but we've, we're on route to version four. So this is um, a, 
a summary, a very brief summary, since we really are running out of time, uh, to tell you what's changed. Um, my colleagues, um, Mike McBride, Dirk Kusher, and Carlos Bernardos, um, we have contributed to this draft. The problem, as you've been hearing, is largely one of, um, if you think about what's going on with just the sheer numbers of devices and the amount of data that's being put onto the network, and then the requirement that there's so much of it that it needs to be transformed or processed, and in turn creates even more data, and that it, sometimes that data is cached or stored at multiple locations in the network, that as this process sort of accelerates, there's more and more data that's distributed around the network and it's increasingly dispersed. And so the original question was, should there be a standard way to find it so that we can use it? And to use it, what I mean is in the context of computing in the network, clearly there's data that you need to marshal as input to these computations. And often these computations or transformations or analytics produce output and so there are, it raises in turn many other questions about where does it come from? Where should it go afterwards? Should it be cached? Should it flow somewhere else or migrate somewhere else? And obviously there's this very close dance with, um, on the one hand, you want the data to be available to some degree, um, uh, exposed if you will, but on the other hand, how do we also at the same time preserve privacy of it? And then the attendant problem that, um, in edge computing, so much of what's pushing the IoT edge to happen is the fact that there's so much data that it's actually not movable. So how does that interplay with compute in the network? Um, and so this is just a summary of sort of what changed since our original draft, um, really tried to ar articulate, although I don't think we're entirely done, what do we mean by edge computing? As you know, that can rattle almost any conversation but the more important question for us and the more important evolution of this draft is that we went from sort of outlining, oh, here are a bunch of discovery um, solutions that already exist to saying, we really want to just discover edge data. And can we, the real important question here is, can we repurpose some of these other discovery mechanisms that are, already exist for the internet to, for something that would handle uh, data. The other important uh, differentiation is that, um, that we realize that data discovery um, is only half of the problem. I mean, there's the, you know, after you generate the data, there's also a placement problem. And so, at, so in this description of this draft and where it needs to go next is to really clarify the life cycle of the data, um, how discovery ties in with the broader data management problem. Um, we clarified all the different kinds of data that we're talking about, everything from, you know, streaming data to control data and metadata to, um, you know, data being not just bags of bits, but functions themselves as services. And um, uh, we tried to clarify also many of the use cases that um, uh, we feel, you know, fall under this umbrella. And in particular, we moved some of the service function chaining discussion there. Um, as I said, we're really running out of time. There are a lot of things we did, all the things with check marks, where we received some terrific and very detailed feedback. So thank you to the list and David Oran in particular. Um, uh, but as I said, I think going forward, this, you know, do we want to, um, oh, right, somebody, I just saw the, the um, note that Phil posted. Uh, because of its name, it doesn't appear as affiliated with um, uh, the working group, the research group. So in the future, going forward, we're going to, we'll name it accordingly. But, um, but there's this, how broad a problem do we want to solve here? And furthermore, you know, like everything else, we really need more thoughtful security section and in particular around privacy. Uh, we met a lot of additional minor details, uh, it, not minor, but, you know, less key uh, inputs around, you know, just sort of finessing what is it that we are trying to solve here. And in fact, this draft is a problem statement draft. And so the question going forward is, um, I will just jump to that in the interest of time. Um, do we adopt this and rename it accordingly so people can find it? Um, how do we, do we want to scope this so it's not merely about data discovery, but really the lifecycle management, management that's required 
to support computing the network. And this is where this ties in with several of the other presentations that were made today. Um, there is this due diligence, which is how, do, one, how are all these other discovery protocols, uh, uh, what is their current maturity to support and are they suitable to support finding data um, amongst other kinds of things in the internet of things? And furthermore, how are other kinds of uh, compute in the network um, types of uh, systems, whether those are, you know, orchestration through containers um, or the solution of finding data through using, um, you know, file systems or distributed hash tables and things like that. How do those fare in terms of support for COIN? So really we're at the stage where this draft is, needs to evolve towards um, really pinpointing the gaps of existing solutions. Um, and some of that could be helped by being more articulate around the requirements that are needed. Uh, we certainly could use the help of somebody who um, has an interest in the security uh, facets. And by security, I mean security, privacy, and trust. So we would welcome involvement there and in general. And then also, as we begin to identify the gaps, really put pen to paper around what are some of the solutions we see. Um, so there you have it. That is our. That's where this draft stands. Thanks for the airtime. Oh, thank you. Um, actually, we're just four minutes set late, so that's good. Um, I will not put up the, the chair slides up again. Uh, I think it's not necessary. Um, thank you so very much. Uh, quite a large number of attendants, so I, I think it's, it's heartwarming that everybody um, uh, the right edge compute to use. This is a question from Philip. Um, Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that that's a certainly a coin question. Um, and, you know, maybe what would help answer that question is if some of the data that we're discovering is the meta information about edges, about their capabilities and their constraints, um, and that those that that metadata is how how current is it? How up to date is it? That would certainly be the kind of data that could contribute to answering, it, you know, which is the right edge compute on which to place this computation. Um, so, uh, so that's answering Ed um, Philip Erdsley's uh, question. Yeah, and I think it it goes back to some of the discussions we've had on com uh, on functional decomposition between um, the edge towards the user and the edge towards the data center, and um, yeah. Very much related. It really relates to like what do we mean by data? I mean, so meta information is is really really important for how things describe their capabilities and in turn how things describe what it is that they're searching for from resources that might be proximate. Yeah. Okay. So now we're five minutes late. So it's still question. great. Um, no, it's okay. great. <laughs> no, it's great. Thank we were supposed to have we were supposed to have three hours in, in uh, Vancouver, so we managed to uh, squeeze everything in two hours, which is um, pretty good. Um, okay, so what I was saying, again, uh, we still have 29 participants on the on the call. We had a maximum of 45, so this was kind of cool. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I think in the the list that I had for for the future was, was this preparation for, for Madrid, and we'll wait for the um the leadership of of both the ietf and iotf to see how this will materialize uh, i could see a few new names on the list which shows our community is expanding thank you very much and uh eve raised uh, a good uh question on one of her last slides which is uh should we start having research group um items and i think that should be for sure on the next um agenda because we have a number of drafts that are uh, that have achieved us at a level of maturity I would say the two the two dirks um, Eve and maybe uh, some of the work uh, from Aachen so let's um, let's keep that in mind for the next uh, meeting uh, I think we must we may see a lot of our a lot of ourselves on on virtual uh, for a while, so uh, let's get used to that. And hopefully at one point we'll be able to meet. Uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you in California, have a great day.
day for those of you in Europe. Have a great evening. And for us in the middle, well, we still have a whole afternoon. Thank you so very much. Thank you uh, to Jeffrey, who's been very quiet. But uh, again, for staying up so late, I forgot. Yeah, for the people in Asia. Oh, my God, it is so incredibly late. Uh, have a good night, everyone. And uh, yeah, we'll see ourselves on WebEx another time. Thanks so much, everyone. I see you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey.